All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the East Asian Institute Distinguished Public Lecture. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. My name is Bert Hoffman. I am the director of the East Asian Institute, and we have a great pleasure to have Professor Christine Wong, who I will introduce formally in, in a moment uh, to give the lecture on Plus à Change, Three Decades of Fiscal Reforms and Central Local Relationships in China. And I'm sure there will be another three decades to come if I were to think about that. Fiscal reforms have been uh, uh, one of the main planks of China's economic reforms in the past uh, the past four decades. And really after, after there was a fiscal crisis in the mid 90s, there was a major reform that Christine, I'm sure will detail uh, and that has turned around the fiscal situation and China can do a lot of things now uh, because of its, uh, because of those fiscal reforms in the past. But the question is, has it been enough and what are the current challenges and what other reforms are, are, uh, are yet to be done to make, if you want, China's fiscal system ready for the 21st century or ready for the new era, as uh, Xi Jinping would say. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have so many of you. We have uh, more than 100 people in the room and they're still filling. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Professor Christine Wong, who is a very dear and old friend of mine. When I was still working with the World Bank, she was on my first mission to China. So, and she knew everything about China, I knew nothing. So she has indeed been my great teacher on China. Uh, professor Wong is now the a visiting research professor at the East Asian Institute. She is also the Bank of America Merrill Lynch visiting chair professor in international finance at Schwarzman Scholars Program at Tsinghua University. Until last year, uh, Christine was professor of Chinese studies and the director of the Center for Contemporary Chinese Studies at the University of Melbourne. Before that, from 2007 to 2013, she was professor of Chinese public finance and director of Chinese studies at the University of Oxford and uh, Andrew M. Jackson professor of international studies at the University of Washington from 2000 to 2007. She's also taught at the University of California, Santa Cruz and Berkeley campuses and at Mount Holyoke. Uh, Christine has also been uh, in the past, we were colleagues in the World Bank uh, she has also be, uh, been in a senior position at the Asia Development Bank and has been consulting for the IMF, for the OECD and the UN. Uh, Professor Christine Wong has written extensively about China's public finance and fiscal reforms. Uh, the list is too long to mention. And frankly, uh, the best thing I can do now is to hand over to Christine for her lecture. Professor Wong, please. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bert, for that uh, lengthy introduction. Uh, very, very happy to be here in Singapore. Um, so let me let me get started because I, I think time is limited and I want to, there, there's quite a lot of material to go through uh, in three decades of reform. So let me share my screen. So we, um, we, we decided that I would talk about three decades of fiscal reform because that's how long I've been working on China's uh, public finance uh, myself. Uh, but in fact, I want to start with this pictorial history uh, or of China's transition in public finance that is four decades long, not three decades, from 1978 to present. Um, and I start here because of the particular shape of this graph that we'll come back to again and again. Uh, and I'm going to just now briefly talk about the first decade where you see this very steep decline uh, in the budget revenue to GDP ratio uh, caused by dismantling the plan mechanisms that had propped up state-owned enterprises and their profitability. And the government was almost entirely dependent on uh, state enterprise profits. And so when they went, so did the budget. Um, the, today I'm going to talk about the broad changes first uh, for the three decades. Uh, these are, I, I say decades, but actually because they coincide roughly with leadership changes. So uh, in China, so we know that they're not decades like from 1990 to uh, 2000, but 1992 
to 2001, and then 2002 uh, to 2012, and so on. So these are rough decades, so please indulge me in that. Uh, and the three decades had very different um, problems, issues that they were facing, and different sets of policies. In the first decade, uh, the focus was on the revenue side, uh, and second decade turned to the, the expenditure side, and then the third decade is the Xi Jinping era, starting in 2013, returning to reform uh, and building institutions. After these um, broad changes, I will talk about where China is today in terms of the local government finance, uh, focusing in particular on the architecture and mechanisms of the intergovernmental fiscal system, uh, but also the legacies of the previous decades. And then uh, end with some speculations about future reform. That will go on for another three decades, as Bert pointed out. So the 1990s uh, reform on the revenue side. So we return to this graph. And this is the decade that I'm talking about where revenues fell all the way to a nadir of 10.2% of GDP in 1995. Uh, when Zhu this is the era of Zhu Rongzi's reforms. Uh, when Zhu Rongzi took over economic uh, work of government um, in 1992, the government control, the, the budget was roughly 13% of GDP, and the central government controlled only 22%, uh, or 3%, less than 3% of GDP. And uh, the central government faced a real fiscal crisis and a crisis of state capacity, uh, in Wang Xiaoguang's words. Uh, I think that's the title of his book. Um, so in Zhu Rongzi then organized the 1994 tax sharing system reform. And there were two very clear objectives to this reform to reverse the two ratios, liang ge bi zhou. Uh, the first ratio was the revenue to GDP ra ratio. And the second one was the central share of total revenues. Uh, and he vowed that central government should never go begging to local governments again for revenues to pay their bills. Uh, and so the, the tax sharing system reform was implemented in 1994 to build a new tax system, um, build a new tax administration to wrest control of tax administration from local governments and to revise the revenue sharing arrangements with local government. Through this fiscal decline, one very clear effect was a collapse of transfers. Uh, again, focusing on this 10 year period, uh, roughly from here, 1992 to 2000, you can see that transfers never, or for most of the decades, stay below 2% of GDP. And for three years, 1994, 95, well, actually 95, 96, 97, transfers were just 1% of GDP. Uh, given the large disparities across provinces in China, uh, the lack of government assistance to the poor regions meant that the disparities in per capita budget expenditures grew through this period across provinces. Uh, so when we look at uh, Shanghai, the, the richest province, the highest per capita uh, budget expenditures in 1990 um, to 2004. Let me get, try to get rid of this. Sorry. Um, if, if we focus on the bottom row, the coefficient of variation across the 31 provincial units, you can see the disparity grew from 1990 to 94 1998, 2002, all the way to 2004, um, because of the lack of, of the very low levels of central government assistance uh, to poor provinces. In Guizhou, for example, um, in the 1990s, before the, the tax sharing system reform, uh, 
about three quarters of Weizhou's revenues came from central transfers. Throughout the 1990s into the early 2000s, it fell to below half. So Weizhou was in a particularly difficult situation. Uh, one example of the disparities uh, that translated to differences in public services. This is a graph of the uh, per student budget expenditure in primary schools. Uh, these are provincial averages. And you have the highest one spending almost 4,500 yuan per student in Shanghai. Uh, the lowest one was Henan, 472 yuan per student, uh, a ninefold difference almost. The poorest province here is Guizhou, but Guizhou actually was slightly better off than Henan. Uh, and I think this is Hubei, 552. These are provincial averages. Uh, even larger disparities uh, were within provinces. We did a study in, in Liaoning province where in 2004, again, per student expenditure averaged 1,200 yuan per student across counties. Uh, there were roughly 40 counties in Liaoning, um, and, but they ranged from one, less than 200 yuan to 2,556 yuan. So huge range, uh, more than 10 to one. In 1986, the education law called for the government to provide nine years of basic education uh, and that it would be compulsory for all children of school age. But even as late as 2004, 17% of rural counties in China did not have enough fiscal resources to provide nine years of schooling for their children. So this is a period when um, many local governments, especially rural local governments, were unable to meet their mandates because of inadequate resources. In the next decade, 2000s, you have a resurgence of government. The 1994 reform succeeded spectacularly in reviving revenues and reversing the fiscal decline. So revenues climbed back up to 22.6% of GDP uh, by 2012, uh, when during this period, GDP was growing also extremely fast at 13.5% per annum during the period in real terms. Uh, and so you have budget revenues that were growing at 22% per annum um, from 1.3 trillion to 11.7 trillion uh, during this decade of roughly 2000-2012. Uh, and expenditures also grew very rapidly at 21% per annum. So this is really a revival of government during the second decade. Uh, and the growing revenues allowed for a very robust expansion of government. Uh, so lots of increased spending on social services and huge investments in infrastructure during that decade. Under the Hu Jintao Wen Jiabao period, so this, this is the second decade and second uh, administration uh, that we're talking about, uh, they, the development paradigm changed to embrace inclusive growth, moving away from just a narrow focus on GDP to talking about building a harmonious society. And under that, many new programs were introduced uh, the, there was the rural policies, the three rurals, San Nong Chang Tse, um, abolished rural fees and then the agricultural tax. Uh, with having wiped out the rural tax base and revenue base, then the central, the, the government had to move in and provide subsidies to the rural sector for the first time. And there were new programs of direct subsidies to farmers, uh, program to building a, a new socialist countryside, improving rural education, uh, expanding access, eliminating fees and tuition uh, in basic education, upgrading spending uh, in schools and dormitories, building lots of new schools and new dorms, and increasing non-wage spending and so on across the board. Healthcare, 
and expanding social safety net. This was a period when they introduced uh, the urban and rural DBAO, the minimum living stipend guarantee uh, and expansion of pension programs, uh, both in the urban and rural areas. Now, some of these uh, programs were very big and very costly. Uh, just to name a few rural programs, the free rural compulsory education uh, eliminated all the fees uh, and tuition for uh, primary and lower middle uh, school students. And the uh, number of students at the peak uh, in 2006 was 140 million. Uh, by now it's below 100 million uh, with declining uh, number of children in the rural sector. And then the rural, the new rural cooperative medical scheme, uh, Wen Jiabao said uh, that it, it covered over 1 billion uh, farmers. Uh, I think that was the peak number in 2003. Uh, and the rural minimum guarantee and so on. You can see these are, these are really huge numbers of beneficiaries and um, enrollees. So this period saw really huge improvements in the funding and provision of services. Uh, both education and health expenditures grew at roughly 24% per annum in constant prices through the period. And so you have uh, universal primary and lower secondary education achieved. Uh, access improved markedly for upper middle, uh, upper middle school, upper secondary school and tertiary levels. You have access to health insurance that became near universal with increased inputs from both the government, uh, from the budget and from social insurance portions. And you have the social protection programs, uh, pension, uh, minimum income guarantees that are universal in coverage. So during this period, basically China built the framework for a comprehensive social welfare system. Uh, and greater central government participation, both in funding and in program design, brought greater uniformity in service standards and timelines for implementation. Whereas in the 1990s, the policy was, this is what the national government calls for, but each locality should proceed according uh, at a pace that's in accordance with local fiscal conditions. So you have uh, programs proceeding at different rates and at different standards of provision, but uh, greater uniformity was brought with greater uh, government participation, central government participation. And it was also during this period that um, studies of income distribution tend to show inequality in China moderating from the mid 2000s um, across the board. During this period though, local governments form most of the new social spending. So if you look at this 2000 to 2000 period, uh, 2012, you have the share of local spending in the budget rose from 65% to 85% by 2000, by uh, 2010 uh, and continuing. Uh, and in RMB terms, it grew from 1 trillion yuan in local spending to 10.7 trillion at the end of this decade. And the government chose to finance the new spending through transfers rather than reassignment of revenues to local government. So you have transfers increasing from roughly 2.5% to um, almost 8% through the period. And because GDP is growing so fast, uh, that transfers grew from 254 billion yuan in 2000 to almost seven and a half trillion yuan uh, in 2012. In terms of local government total expenditure, transfers in 2000 funded 16% of the total by the end of the period in 2012, central government transfers were financing 59% of local expenditures. 
So in contrast to the 1990s, there were no more complaints about local governments not having the resources to finance services, right? So the, the story about central government inviting to dinner parties and leaving the bill to local governments was a thing of the 1980s and 1990s and not so true from the mid 2000s onward. Transfers were also better targeted through this period to bring greater equalization across regions. Uh, to return to that uh, picture of per student spending in primary schools and how uh, dispersed the um, level of spending was, the um, coefficient of variation uh, across provinces uh, in spending fell from 0 0.77 in 2004, the picture I showed you, to 0 0.63 in 2010, and all the way down to 0 0.39 in 2015. This is across provinces, looking at provincial averages, but a very significant achievement. Moving into the third decade, um, there was a comprehensive reform of the fiscal system that was announced in early 2014 um, with phase one in public financial management reforms starting immediately and phase two uh, reform of the tax system to begin in 2015 and phase three to turn to intergovernmental reform in 2016 with a promise to realign revenues and spending across levels of government. Um, to just briefly, um, the phase one, the public financial management reforms have been proceeding since 2014, and they uh, have reined in extra budgetary uh, resources to a large extent. They've improved transparency of local government reporting uh, to a remarkable uh, extent and they are strengthening accountability uh, and uh, pinning accountability of spending uh, all the way to the uh, leading cutters of the local governments uh, and their performance is evaluated and recorded in their personnel dossiers, their dangan, to hold them really accountable. Uh, you notice I skipped over reigning in local government borrowing which is a very, has, has yet to succeed, um, although uh, the government is trying in, in various ways to narrow the scope uh, of uh, what local governments can do. But mainly, reigning in local government borrowing has also been tied to the accountability, uh, tied to the personnel system. Reform of the tax system has proceeded only partially uh, we have VAT reform, but the property tax is uh, not yet. Uh, it's been on the docket since I think 2015 or, or 16, uh, and yet to be passed. Uh, and resource taxes have only been marginally uh, improved. And intergovernmental reform uh, is very slow in uh, coming out of the stables. But before I talk about the um, uh, prospects for reform, I want to go into the details. Uh, and this is what Bert calls going down a rabbit hole in looking at how the system works, the, uh, in looking at the architecture and mechanisms of China's intergovernmental fiscal system, which I think um, is necessary to understand how things work. Okay, so you have this, five levels of government, uh, central government, provincial level, municipal level, uh, municipalities, prefectures, then county level, and then townships, towns and neighborhoods. Uh, the intergovernmental system, uh, this is a, a quite unique feature of China's uh, fiscal decentralization. It's not just decentralization to local governments, but decentralization all the way to the grassroots level of government. So you see, this is a uh, 2016 breakdown uh, where central government accounted for less than 15% of expenditure 
provinces, uh, 14 plus percent. Uh, the prefectural municipal level, 25 percent. And then nearly half was accounted for by the counties. So in about 2015, I think um, townships uh, were are no longer a an independent level of budget. So this um, all the rural services now go to the county level. So th this is this is the big piece here. Well, it turns out that rebalancing the budget towards social spending uh, during the Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao period has changed the locus of expenditure within the intergovernmental system. Okay. So you have expenditure shares by uh, subnational or by, by tier of government, including central government. The red line that goes up to the right is counties. And its share of the national budget rose from 26% to 46% from about 2013 onward and has continued at this high level. Uh, the data stops in 2016 uh, because the Ministry of Finance no longer provides that breakdown. Um, but I don't have any reason to expect that things have changed significantly. So I imagine counties are still uh, accounting for somewhere around 46, 47% of the total budget. Nothing much changed for the provincial level, some minor, this is the prefectural level, and the provincial level is this gray line here. And the central government share has fallen from 35% all the way down to 15% uh, since 2011 and has stayed there. Uh, this is a very, very small share for central governments uh, compared to other countries in the world. Now, during this period, revenue assignments haven't changed much because uh, the tax sharing system remains the um, legislation that defines the revenue shares of different levels of government. So you have relatively flat lines here. Uh, and so what happens then is that the vertical imbalances that have existed since uh, 1994 uh, for central local have also uh, changed in the, uh, for the intergovernmental. And this is a table that is a very rough accounting taking the, the two graphs I've just shown you, the expenditure share uh, and take, subtracting that from the revenue share of each level of government. So you have central government collecting almost 50% of revenues, but spending 15%. So this is why you have a big surplus at the central level. You have the county level government collecting 20 plus percent of, of revenues, but spending 46% of the budget. So you have a big minus. And you can see the county level uh, deficit is growing over time. Uh, and in fact, in aggregate, every sub-national level of government has been running a um, budget uh, deficit or shortfall uh, through, throughout all the way to 2016. And the central surpluses are financing some portion of expenditures for each level of subnational government, uh, provinces, prefectures, and counties. The vertical sum of each column is zero. So this is, this is the surplus that goes down to um, fill the gaps at each level. To take some numbers from 2016, the fiscal shortfall at the county level, the, the bottom level, um, came to 4.6 trillion yuan, uh, which was more than its own revenues of 4.1 trillion. And compared to total central government transfers to local governments, it turns out that the county level absorbed 87% of all transfers. Okay. So it, it means that delivering social services imposes a very heavy burden on China's administrative structure. On the one hand, the central government, um, this is a share of central revenues 
that are devoted to transfers. So in 2000, the central government gave back about 36% of its revenues to local governments to finance their shortfall. And this share rose to close to 70% here and then stayed at roughly 70% for a number of years and then shot up last year to 84%, 84.4% in 2019 uh, because of uh, shortfalls in revenue, local uh, revenue collection. This graph looks at the, um, this is a perspective from the county. The blue bars are the um, shortfall at the county level in, uh, this is in yi yuan, so 100 million yuan units. So in 2010, it was roughly 2 trillion yuan. By 2016, it was uh, 4.6 trillion yuan, okay? And this is the, the, the orange line is the share of or the county's share of total central revenues that rose from roughly 70% through these middle years all the way up to nearly 90% in 2000, from 2016 on. Okay. Now, if we turn to the mechanism through which transfers reach spending units, we can see how cumbersome and inefficient this intergovernmental system is. Uh, you have the, the four levels of budget, uh, and then you have spending units at the bottom. The money has to go from the central government to the provinces. To explain uh, how this really works, the central government uh, makes transfers only to the provinces. Central government does not make any transfers below the provincial level. It depends on the provinces uh, to turn the money over to lower levels. Uh, and at the provincial level, so the central government takes the transfers and cuts them into 31 pieces for the, well, actually 35 pieces because there are these uh, deputy, 36, sorry, five deputy provincial municipalities, so, you know, cities that have uh, deputy province status, uh, Qingdao, Dalian, uh, Shenzhen, uh, Deng Deng. Okay, so it cuts into 36 pieces and hands them down. And then it relies on each piece to distribute within their territory. Okay, and the provinces do the same thing. Uh, so a uh, Henan province will take the transfers from central government and cuts it into, um, I don't remember how many prefectures there are in Henan, into say 14 pieces and hands down uh, to the next layer. And the next layer does the same thing to the counties. So this is a system that depends on um, sequential delegation right? Um, so that when central government uh, gives money to finance rural compulsory education, the money leaves Beijing Treasury, goes to Henan Treasury in Zhengzhou, and then it has to depend on Zhengzhou, uh, the Henan provincial government, to divide up and send the money down to the, the rural schools via the municipalities and then the municipalities do the same thing uh, to the counties and then depend on the counties to send the money down to the schools, okay? Uh, it is, central government does not have information on whether the money reaches the schools in Henan. It doesn't actually even have information about whether the money reaches uh, the appropriate counties uh, in Henan province. Okay, to illustrate just how difficult it is in through the system to ensure that funds go through in time and in full. We have a, a nice case this year uh, in the fiscal stimulus package um, at the NPC the, in late May the government announced that um, there will be a 2 trillion yuan allocation 
that will travel through a new um, direct pass-through mechanism, uh, to make sure that the money reaches the grassroots government quickly so that they can fund the um, social protection programs and other uh, vital public services, okay, to uh, ensure that uh, could, uh, and also grassroots government could function uh, normally, even through the, the COVID uh, pandemic. So the, the original allocation was 2 trillion yuan. Uh, this, was, this was trumpeted uh, throughout the NPC and there were many press conferences discussing the special uh, express mechanism. Just last week, the Ministry of Finance uh, announced how this money has reached local levels. Uh, and it actually provided these details where somehow the 2 trillion yuan commitment had shrunk to 1.7 trillion, okay? So the central government is talking about sending 1.7 trillion downward to the grassroots. Uh, and of that, they said 1.695 trillion was handed over to the provinces. Uh, so 5 billion yuan uh, was somehow kept back for uh, administrative costs. I don't know what, uh, for dividing into 36 pieces. Uh, and then the provinces said that they turned over to prefectures 1.615 trillion yuan. So another 80 billion um, leaked out somehow. And the prefectures reported that they have now turned over 1.553 trillion to the counties. So what was received at the county was equal to 78% of the 2 trillion yuan and almost half a trillion has gone missing uh, from this uh, mechanism. Uh, and because it's taken five months for the money to get through, uh, the actual spending at the grassroots level is now only 1.2 trillion, 60% uh, of the target. Uh, they have two months left to spend the rest. So even in this, in this very special program where they are talking about a special new direct pass-through mechanism, uh, you still have, it's very difficult to avoid uh, some diversions along the way. And it still takes a lot of time to get through. A byproduct of the intergovernmental system is a bifurcation of rural and urban local governments. Okay? Um, in this hierarchical administrative structure, no distinction is made um, between urban and rural local governments. Uh, the only they only differentiate by hierarchy or administrative rank. Okay, so you have provincial level, prefectural level, you have county level, etc. But no urban and rural, it's, it's difficult to uh, isolate them. The, the system of tax sharing does not seem to leave enough to the very fast growing cities uh, and their uh, very fast growing demand for urban services. And also, in a system that's dependent on transfers to fund more than half of subnational expenditures, transfers are now uh, rooted to try to equalize uh, fiscal capacity. So they're aimed at lower revenue regions uh, because cities have better tax bases. They're not the poorest uh, regions in terms of fiscal revenues. Uh, and so urban local governments do not uh, receive a lot of transfers. And then finally, uh, there have been reforms to try to facilitate the pass through of transfers to the grassroots level uh, and the Shengguan Xian reform, you know, turning control of counties over to provinces uh, is meant to bypass municipalities uh, to uh, try to reduce the leakages. Again, cutting into uh, cities' access to fiscal resources. So look, looking again at this um, hierarchical division of revenues and expenditures, uh, 
I, I want to emphasize that it, it looks like cities do not get enough um, attention in this system. So China was urbanizing very rapidly through this period uh, in this table. So uh, from actually beginning 1990s, but in uh, 2000, oh, sorry, in 1998 uh, prefectural level. So we don't have an urban uh, le level of government uh, or a unit uh, that we can count, but we have prefectures, which are net of the, the counties below them. And so prefectures come closest to an urban level of government. So there, there are four cities that are in the provincial level, uh, there's Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Chongqing, but the vast majority of the provincial level is rural, uh, urban and rural mixed. The county is largely rural, even though there are many county level cities uh, and city districts, but primarily it's rural. Uh, and, but the prefecture is the closest to an urban level. And you can see that prefectures lost expenditure share from 1998 to 2013, even though during this period, the urbanization rate uh, went from 33% in China to 54%. And so while population was shifting from counties to prefectures, um, fiscal expenditures were shifting the other way. So this treatment uh, means uh, of the, the two types of local government set off different dynamics. You have very rapid urbanization that has required huge investment in infrastructure that's funded mostly by local governments and they don't have enough resources in the budget. So they turn to extra budgetary channels, selling land and borrowing. And of course, until 2015, they were prohibited from borrowing. So they created corporate entities to do so. And these are off budget and beyond the oversight of higher level governments. Uh, and they created a soft budget constraint. Uh, but as long as city governments were allowed to to tap resources off budget. Uh, I think they were happy to accept the, uh, the trade-off, to accept the rural tilt of the Hu Jintao Wen Jiabao policies within the budget. So this bifurcation has reinforced the urban-rural divide uh, where rural governments became increasingly dependent on transfers while urban governments relied largely off budget on off budget finance. Uh, on the one hand, this has allowed uh, urban governments to, to go off budget and tap resources to produce outperformance in economic growth and investments in infrastructure. But it has also led to very risky <clears throat> and unsustainable dependence on land uh, borrowing, uh, it created urban sprawl and unaffordable housing. It also means that local, uh, central government has little leverage over cities. So when the, the central government is trying to enforce inclusive policies and they're funding more and more of the social services, cities continue to exclude migrants from full participation in vital services, including subsidized housing education, healthcare, pensions, unemployment insurance, uh, and so on. So turning back to looking at the reforms, current reforms, um, the thrust of the reform is centralizing and, and very incremental. Uh, the realignment of, of expenditures and revenues is going to be come from centralizing some expenditure functions rather than turning over more revenues to local government. Uh, and they've uh, talked about large infrastructure projects, um, national defense, foreign affairs. Now you may be surprised to see that uh, national defense and foreign affairs require recentralization. Uh, and that's because local governments used to have to share some costs of both of these uh, normally central expenditures. Uh, and the, the promise is that for programs with spillover effects, the central government would provide joint funding. 
and they're slowly uh, determining how to do that. And the emphasis is on improving transfers and stopping unfunded mandates. Uh, but basically, the reforms have been uh, to try to do the same things, but do it better, right? Um, going forward, I think China's shift towards social spending uh, will continue. Uh, in the pre-transition period, the government spent half of its budget on capital spending annually, and mainly uh, for state-owned enterprises. Uh, and by 2018, almost 40% of the budget has gone into social services. Uh, but this is very low compared to OECD countries, where typically two thirds of the budget goes to social services, social spending. And China's spending on key services lag behind uh, OECD levels uh, in education, in health, uh, in uh, social welfare, pensions, and so on. And it lags behind levels even in upper middle income countries. And so leading the growth in the future for China will be pensions, health spending, but some um, social welfare, social protection programs as well. To sum up, reforms in the 1990s were a great success uh, that ended the fiscal decline and provided government with revenues to provide services and support economic growth. China wouldn't be where it is today without the uh, tax sharing system reform. Reforms in the 2000s to build a harmonious society created the basic framework for a comprehensive social welfare system and reversed some of the regional disparities uh, from earlier decades. In the third decade, reforms announced in 2014 have progressed slowly uh, and there are some signs of backsliding in the last couple of years uh, and funding gaps are re-emerging at the county level uh, and unfunded mandates are now uh, once again uh, becoming a big complaint. Uh, but the biggest obstacle uh, in my view for China to advance to the next stage of building a modern fiscal system uh, is the administrative system and the outdated processes associated uh, with that. Just to return to the architecture of the system, uh, the problems are not just the division of revenues and expenditures, they're tightly linked to the administrative system uh, and processes and the mis mismatch between that structure and the needs of social service delivery has created inefficiencies and waste and in this year's COVID crisis, China's social protection system has completely been ineffective in responding to the emerging needs of the unemployed uh, and those who've lost income. Going forward, a high income country will demand high levels of social services that are best delivered by local governments with flexibility to respond to local conditions and managing the financing and provision of these services will require changes that go far beyond the fiscal system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wong. This was very, very interesting and uh, nobody left the Zoom. That is the best, the best standard for interest. So everybody stayed online as you were speaking. Uh, I have uh, one remark, uh, please use the Q&A function for questions and then I will read out the questions that come in. And there's already a few, but I hope there will be many, many more. Uh, I just briefly take one moment as you are formulating your questions to show one slide of my own. And um, I know that Professor Christine Wong already has seen this once, but this is just to prove, and if you read, <laughs> if you read the title, this, this was, the, if you want, the defining inter, international conference on the intergovernmental fiscal system. Uh, and, and look at the date, 1993. Well, this proves two things. One, Professor Wong <laughs> was in the room as it happened, as, uh, as the Hamilton musical says. Uh, 
uh, there was also a young man here from the World Bank that uh, had a lot more hair than today. But the second thing is that, that, that Professor Wong has really not aged one bit since that time. So okay. with that slide, <laughs> we go to your questions. And we have a number of in very interesting questions. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, a practical question. I'll read out two. There's a practical question. Uh, do you know why the, the Ministry of Finance stopped publishing these breakdowns on levels of government, which is relatively unhelpful for not just for academics, but also for policymakers? And the second uh, is, is a question that, 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 uh, that you and I both have worked on, uh, is the, impl in the implications of the, uh, the fiscal implication of WHOCO reforms. And, and is that a reason why, why government doesn't work or, or that, that doesn't move on the WHOCO reforms? And what are the fiscal implications and how can they be adapted in the current system? Let's start with these two. And these were from Philip Andrew Speed and from David Lubin. Thank you for your questions. Um, thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, the, I, I have no answer to why the Ministry of Finance stopped publishing data on the breakdowns uh, by level of government. Um, but if, if anybody knows the answer, I'd love to hear it. Um, but uh, on the WUCO question, the um, I, I do believe that the decentralized fiscal system is a big reason for the hardness of the WUCO uh, divide. Uh, and and I, I've written a paper that argued that it's because urbanization happened starting in the 1990s uh, when uh, urban governments were suddenly faced with uh, declining fiscal revenues like everybody else uh, and people flooding into the cities and wanting to enroll in schools, needing uh, to go see doctors in clinics, go to hospitals, uh, you need housing, uh, you need uh, public transportation, all kinds of, of services. And to try to contain costs, uh, they turn to a very useful administrative device, uh, and that is the hukou. Okay, so we, can, we only have so much money, we can only provide for our citizens. And uh, in, I, I looked at the education sector, and it was very interesting because um, the, there were complaints and there were discussions between local governments and higher level governments about whose responsibility is it to take in the, the kids uh, in schools. Uh, and they, they determined in the 1990s that actually um, your, your right to schooling is tied to your hukou. Okay, so your hukou government uh, is responsible for providing schooling for you. Uh, and they are responsible for enforcing this compulsory nature of the education. So if you're not in school back in your village, you needed to go back to your county to apply for permission not to be there. And with that letter, you can come back to the city and then ask to be admitted. And, and um, the agreement was that if you are going to be admitted, then you should be bearing the cost yourself because you're not a local citizen. Okay. Now, the, the central government could have stopped this, uh, but in the 1990s, central government was not, did not have the resources to step in. And so they waited until 2000 to change the ruling to call for local governments to admit students um, uh, where, where they live rather than where they came from. Uh, and then the question is, how do you pay for that? Um, and because central government is already paying for rural schooling, in principle, it's possible for them to take the money they allocate for student X, who has left Henan and moved that money out of Henan and give it to Shanghai, where the kid has landed. Um, politically, that's very difficult because Henan is a poor province, Shanghai is very rich. Why would you give transfers to a rich place. Secondly, it turned out that the transfers are so complicated, it's embedded in the administrative structure 
So we learned that there are three sets of figures that the Ministry of Finance can use for the capitation grants that they give for rural education. One is school level data. Okay, so when the kids show up to school, they swipe their card and they get counted at the school. Uh, second one is reported by the Education Bureau, the local Education Bureau. And then the third one is from the uh, Bureau of Statistics that takes the population data and you can uh, project how many kids are in school. The most accurate one should be the school level data. And the most inaccurate one is the Education Bureau data because they have an incentive to over-report enrollments. And the ones they're using now is the Education Bureau data. And so this has to do with personnel allocations. Teachers are the, the largest single uh, component of public employment of, aside from civil servants uh, in the, at the county level. Uh, and it's, you don't want to be losing teachers. You know, when the kids move away, uh, you, should, you should lose teachers over time. But these are very good jobs that uh, local governments want to hang on. So it's really a political economy issue. Uh, but funding is absolutely at the core of the HUCO reform. All right, thanks. Uh, if you're interested in more detail, the World Bank, uh, with help of Professor Wong, did a report a couple of years back. It's called Urban China. Some of these estimates are in there. One on the, on the other side of the equation is that if you look at providing infrastructure and infrastructure services, it's actually cheaper in cities to do so. If you want to have a similar level of, of services, and as many, many government services are cheaper in cities than they are in the countryside, simply because of the concentration of people. Uh, there's a couple of questions around the same theme of, of sort of how does this, this intergovernmental fiscal system works and how much losses are there? And the first is from Rajiv Law is how do we, do we have a sense of how much of central governments are really wasted or leaked or whether they're just delayed? And, and, and what does it take to actually, to actually fix that? And second uh, uh, question by uh, John Donaldson, who's asking, uh, uh, how does this work with subsidies for farmers? Do they directly go to the farmers or do they also go through this whole uh, four level, four level transfer uh, system? And the third, which is related is, could, can you elaborate on how this bifurcation of the fiscal system leads to urban sprawl at the country, county municipal level, uh, remark okay. you make during your lectures. Thanks. Okay. All very good questions. Um, how to stop leakages or what, what, do, what do the leakages, uh, what are the leakages? Are they just wasted money? Um, no, I, I would think that they're not. Uh, for example, the, in, in looking at the recent, the two trillion yuan um, direct express transfer that uh, got shrunk to 1.7. The central government explained that they decided to hold back 300 billion to spend on um, prevention and um, control of the COVID. Okay, probably they're spending it on uh, this massive testing uh, of, of whole cities. Uh, but this, this um, Yes, it's, it's, it's quite a legitimate expense uh, of government, but this was, why did they have to take it out of the local portion that they had said they were going to give to locals uh, is, is a question I would ask the central government if I had a chance. Um, and then the other leakages, you know, as, as I explained, every subnational level has um, deficits, uh, vertical fiscal deficits. It means that they have expenditure needs that need to be filled. Uh, and they may feel that they are just as legitimate as the expenditure needs of lower levels. And when you go through this level by level downward transfer, the higher levels have more power. Um, and so they, they can hold back on some of the transfers uh, and it's hard for lower, lower levels to fight back. Uh, 
and I, I think, I hope that that answers the first question. Uh, on the farmers' subsidies, all subsidies go through the layer by layer transfer. So the farmers' direct subsidies, uh, that just means that the money goes uh, into the farmers' hands uh, instead of going through you know, some uh, institution. So it, it, the direct subsidy really is, is kind of referring to changing from the old uh, planning economies uh, bias of giving everything to the production side and through public institutions rather than to, to individuals. These are monies that are handed directly to farmers. But it still goes through the four layers. So the money that comes to the farmers goes down to the county uh, and then the county issues, uh, you know, transfers the money to the farmers' accounts, their, their WeChat account or their Alipay account, whatever. And then on the urban sprawl, what's what's the um, by, by, what does bifurcation have to do with the urban sprawl? Uh, well, urban governments are highly dependent on land revenues. Even after talking about trying to wean local governments off land sales, uh, even in 2019, land sales accounted for about 30% of local, this is aggregate local government revenues. Uh, at the prefectural level, it would be a greater share. Uh, in addition, so you, you want to, um, so local, local governments have a monopoly uh, although this may be changing with the recent land reform um, that I don't quite understand yet. But until now, um, only governments have the right to convert farmland to non-farm use. So all of the conversion of farmland has to go through local governments and local governments make money uh, taking farmland, preparing it, and then selling it to developers. Uh, and it's easier for them and, and it's more profitable for them to do greenfield development than to redevelop old neighborhoods. Because when you redevelop old neighborhoods, you have to compensate people for moving out. Uh, and it's the, the compensation costs are rising. Uh, and so you, you, that's why in Chinese cities, you find that the, you have old uh, especially the lower income old neighborhoods um, tend not to get developed uh, until you know they're the last to be developed, whereas the city then leaps over them to go out to greenfield. Uh, and this is, this is what we call urban sprawl and that's what causes it, right? So you have, that's why in Beijing you have now six, seven, eight rings now, ring roads. Uh, even though within you know, inner Beijing, you still have old rundown neighborhoods that are not developed, redeveloped. All right, we go to the revenue side. I know there's a few more questions on the, on the spending and transfer side. I might come back to them later on if we have time. Uh, but on the, on the revenue side, first, uh, uh, a, a question with Dr. Zhao Li Tao. Uh, in recent years, Chinese government has uh, done a lot to reduce the tax burden of enterprises, or as others would say, giving away the tax base. Mm -hmm. uh, which, which, which level of government was most affected there? And, and how does it work out for, for, for the revenue side? And related, but, but separate, a question from Margaret Molnar of the OECD uh, is, uh, how, how will the, these tax reforms that you mentioned on the books uh, and, and how do they work with what has recently happened? The, the personal income tax reforms, uh, they keep on increasing the, the exemption level. So nobody, nobody pays any personal income tax. Yeah, yeah. If you're smart enough to make a lot of money, you're smart enough not to pay any tax, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's also the, the eternal talk about the real estate tax or the property tax. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which ones are really going to happen in the coming years? Because because if you look at the expenditure pressures, mm -hmm. um, um, China probably needs more money. Um, yes, thank you for those questions. Um, if, if you remember the very first uh, curve of the fiscal decline and then fiscal recovery, and then at the far right, you have a dipping again. 
uh, of the revenue curve uh, so that it's now below 20% of GDP. Uh, I think it's the latest is below 19% of GDP, uh, you know, from a high of 22, 23% of GDP, I think. Uh, so over the last five years, um, the Ministry of Finance and the government have been very busy cutting taxes. Uh, uh, so raising, they, they've cut the VAT rates from 17% to 16%. You know, they now have three rates of, of VAT. I lose track of them. 13% down to 12% and then 10% down to 9%. So across the board cuts uh, in taxes and raising the threshold of uh, enterprise income taxes uh, and forgiving um, small enterprises, small and medium enterprises, uh, taxes, uh, etc. I think for the VAT, everybody gets, um, you know, all levels of government get hurt in the same way. Uh, but in giving away the uh, SME, the small medium enterprise uh, taxes, uh, it's mostly the small towns uh, and districts, uh, county level that are, or at least they say they're hurt more. Uh, I haven't seen figures that we can, and we, we don't have the breakdowns to really uh, verify that. But you can imagine that in a big city, you have diversified economy, you have a range of enterprises, uh, whereas in small towns, you're more dependent on these uh, small businesses uh, and you might be relatively hurt more. And that adds to the, the fiscal pain of local governments that seems to be appearing more and more. Uh, for, from Margit's uh, question, I think she probably knows the answers more than I do, uh, better than I do, because I, I don't know when the property tax is going to appear. I remember working on a, a World Bank mission in 2007 and being rushed out of one meeting uh, to the uh, State Council Development Research Council uh, for an urgent conference on the property tax because, you know, government was ready to roll it out. And so they wanted desperately to hear from World Bank experts. That was 2007, I think. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I think yesterday somebody said that, um, so what, one, one speculation was that the property tax can't be rolled out because uh, that would reveal how many properties all of these officials own uh, around the country, you know, and, and politically too costly. But I heard yesterday that, uh, in fact, the government already has this information because you are required annually to report, if you're a civil servant, you have to report uh, all of your assets and holdings. So this in information is, is clear and known, and maybe they're just waiting for an opportune moment uh, after they've knocked off all these really corrupt people uh, to roll out the property tax. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and as to why they, every time they start to collect more personal income tax, um, they raise the threshold for levying and throw lots of people off the tax roll. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, when it, it's clear when Wen Jiabao did it, he liked to be liked. I'm not sure that Xi Jinping cares quite the same way, but um, he did it uh, last year, two years ago. So maybe maybe that's a driving force. Yeah, well, there's this line that somebody invented and started a tea party with, I think it's called uh, no, no taxation without representation. And that may holding, be holding back direct income tax and VAT is a lot less in a lot less transparent that people don't really yeah. notice. Uh, my take my take on the property tax actually uh, there's a lot of taxation of property at the transfer stage yes. and frankly it, it's 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 not so easy to introduce a property tax simply because uh, uh, if you have all old people that have very low income but they happen to live in an apartment that is worth a couple of million dollars because it is in the center of Beijing. That's a real problem. So my take on it is that a surcharge on a personal income tax almost works as well. And that may just be the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a question from, from Adam Liu. Uh, 
uh, from the Lake on your school. And he said, look, it has, has to do with the distribution of resources. And there's a, there's a second question, uh, and I'll, I'll name the person in a moment. So Adam asks, look, Great Joe uh, is one of the Western poor provinces uh, and, and they're supposed to get more money from transfers, but at the same time, they're also among the most indebted uh, mm -hmm. uh, provinces in the whole system. Is it because the, because the distribution is wrong? And second, um, that Te Kuishin asks, look, there's, there's this constant complaint on the revenue sharing by Ju Rongji, but there were a lot of complaints. But one of them was that it never reached below the province. So that, that real that really the reform stopped at the provincial level and that sub-provincial, there's still lots of things going on that are actually not very compatible with the broad design of the tax sharing reforms. What is your what is your view on that? And I think that's related to this distribution issue with of uh, of Adam Liu. Um, on on the um, on the local government debt, uh, Guizhou is one of the highly indebted provinces. Um, I, I don't know what I'm not sure what the relationship uh, is of that to distribution. Uh, basically. A lot of this debt was was accrued when local governments borrow to develop uh, infrastructure and businesses, uh, and the more ambitious governments um, borrowed more. And then, in a in a poor province like Weizhou, their business conditions are probably not as good, and so they would have they should they're at a higher risk of of. Uh, Having debts that they can't repay, that they keep um, reborrowing, and so that it, it runs up the debt total debt stock over time. Um, and maybe you can clarify that question if I'm not if I'm not answering uh, on on the reforms never reaching below the provincial level. This is how the administrative system is structured. The province, the, the central government never reaches below the, the province level. Uh, at the Ministry of Finance, they said, we don't deal with anything below the province level. Uh, we only, you know, we would only talk to provincial officials. If they have a complaint, they can come see us. But if you're from a prefectural city, you don't have the right to come to the Ministry of Finance. You should be going to your province, your provincial uh, finance department. So this is how the, the division of labor is. And, and it's like that partly because of the uh, personnel, the, the personnel system works exactly like the administrative system. Um, central government is very, very small. Uh, and so it can only face the 36 provincial units uh, and the next layer should be able to face you know, their subordinate units and the premise is that each level of government is closer to uh, the spending and the people, uh, and they should have more information uh, than the higher level, and the higher level then can uh, depend on. And then this is why um, the party remains so important throughout in policy implementation, because the party is, is a Leninist organization that has uh, you know, direct control from top to bottom. Government doesn't. And so it's not a Zhurongzi reform issue. It's, it's all of Chinese government, you know, all of uh, policy implementation never reaches below. And, and even now, you know, in discussions with uh, the, um, the now, now called the National School of Fiscal Studies, um, they, they say, well, you know, there are two, two sides to intergovernmental reform. There's a central, provincial, and then there's a province, sub-province. We only deal with central province. Okay, so this, this is the division of labor. Which is quite unusual for a unitary state such as China. Yeah. Uh, but it has been a perennial problem. And as I said, it probably goes back to the Ming Dynasty, this, this incongruency of, of, of administrative structure and, and spending me. But, but in a way, you cannot build a rational system if you don't say, OK, here's the various expenditure responsibility per level, and then have sort of a, a broad allocation of resources that match those responsibilities. Um, 
Right. Um, we go to uh, a bit more on the uh, Dong Tao. Dr. Chi Dong Tao has a question on the uh, uh, on a remark that you made. You said, "Look, the pandemic showed really the ineffectiveness of China's social services or social mm -hmm. spending as 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 a response to the to the pressures uh, revealed by COVID." Can you elaborate on that? Um, well, we we have a BB that's about to come out. <laughs> um, hopefully. Um, but it basically, you know, even with tens of millions of people out of work uh, for at least a period of time in China, the unemployment insurance beneficiaries did not increase. Uh, I think that the, they increased by 20,000 people uh, from first quarter to second quarter. Uh, and then when you look at Dibao, you know, which is supposed to be the default that catches everybody who doesn't um, qualify for unemployment insurance. The DBAO ranks um, rose only by one, one and a half, less than one and a half million people uh, through September, I think, uh, of this year. So this, this is a pretty low level of response to, you know, in what other countries have you know, huge numbers of unemployed, um, you know, you have double digit unemployment rates and everybody, you know, three quarters of the workforce uh, receiving benefits uh, and assistance from government in some countries. Uh, so basically China, in China, especially the rural migrants who do not qualify, uh, even if they were enrolled in unemployment insurance, the rules say that if you have you have to go back to your hukou place to receive benefits. Uh, or you can take a, a one-time lump sum payout from the unemployment insurance pool that's very uh, biased, uh, discriminatory against uh, rural migrants. All right. Um, we have quite a few more questions, but we're also running out of time. Um, let me just stay close to the topic. Uh, one final question on the intergovernmental fiscal system, and then I have a final question that's on the uh, final, final question that's on the pension system. On the intergovernmental fiscal system, and, and given these issues that you have signaled in the in your talk, wh what is what, what would you recommend to the government on how to solve this? What what's what's the program of reforms for the next five or ten years uh how should one how should one go ahead and it's <laughs> you lay had uh, is, is that question basically is one more person that had the similar question well it, it, it's easier to analyze the problem than to come up with solutions obviously um, <clears throat> that's why i'm not um I'm an academic now and not at the World Bank uh, where you're expected to have answers. <laughs> this, this is a problem that China has had. Um, it, it's kind of, you know, you can go back to the, the old um, Maoist period when faced with a, um, a planning system that requires much more um, control and management capacity at the central level. Uh, Mao Zedong decided that he didn't want to go down the Soviet path and build a huge central bureaucracy like the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, basically China is now has a budget that is as large as the U.S. government budget, almost. Um, and it has a fraction, a tiny fraction of the number of employees. I think the last time I looked, the federal government had two and a half million employees. Um, the central government in China has 60,000 people. And it's very difficult to manage programs, uh, increasingly sophisticated programs, you know, with increasingly finer targeting uh, of beneficiaries. Uh, from afar, you know, five, four levels up uh, and depend on each level to uh, translate uh, 
and transmit faithfully uh, the directives and the resources and then hold lower levels accountable for those results. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, big data and, and AI might provide some solutions. But again, you get back to the issue of political economy that I mentioned um, in terms of the education grants. Even if you can do it with the, the appropriate data, you have to overcome bureaucratic resistance to the massive reallocation that would be required in resources and authorities across levels of government uh, for the central government to... So this is, this is a system that's top down and depends on the central government to set the directives and to hold lower levels accountable uh, because there's no downward accountability to the people. Um, and so lower level governments only look upward. They don't have to look downward. Uh, and this is, this is an interesting problem where uh, central governments in some ways are more responsive to popular wishes and desires than local governments are. Uh, so one, one, you know, it's going to take a long time to, to come up with, uh, there, there are many choices that China has, you know, about whether they want to continue this top-down system or they want to decentralize some uh, responsibilities to local governments and allow them to manage their own affairs and decide what standards of, of services they will provide uh, and how to provide it. Uh, but you have to find a way to uh, improve the incentives uh, so that they uh, come to the right kinds of outcomes consistent with national goals, right? which uh, they should be working on and haven't yet. Um, final, final question. Uh, we haven't talked about the pension system much yet but it's going to be an increasing part of the intergovernmental fiscal picture simply because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot more pensioners now there's a lot more unfunded mandates at the local level now at some point there was question of uh, using some of the state enterprise um, assets and revenues to fill if you want the pension system mm -hmm. uh, how's that going joe horn from uh, bangkok is asking this question how is that going? Yeah, how is um, it? Oh. <laughs> they, they have been collecting <clears throat> more and more uh, from the state enterprises. So state enterprises uh, both have to, to assign some of their shares to the National Social Security Fund. And that's been ongoing for the last three to five years. Uh, and then there's the um, state capital operating budget. Uh, and 30% of, so they, the, the, uh, when Lo Chi Wei was finance minister, he set a goal that by 2020, the proportion of, of the revenues of that fund uh, should be remitted to the central government, 30% of it should be remitted. And so it, it went from 18% to 20 some percent. This year, they are taking 30% of that. So they are successfully capturing um, you know, the, the state enterprises, uh, the, the, the small portions that are turned over to this, to this fund. So step by step, they're trying to build up that fund. Um, they are also um, trying to raise the pooling of the pension insurance pools. Uh, and they are using quite heavy handed uh, tactics now to uh, force provincial pooling uh, that they've talked about for almost 20 years, it's happening. It's, it's going to be completed this year. And the next step is central pooling. And they've set up a fund and they are um, collecting, uh, they're, they're collecting these big surpluses from Guangdong province uh, and giving it to the Dongbei provinces, Liaoning, Jilin, Heilongjiang. Uh, I think under Xi Jinping's government, central government does have enough power to force that. Uh, they didn't have it before. Yeah, so maybe some reforms that have been lingering for a long time might actually happen. Well, very good. Thank you so much. Thanks you everybody for attending. We still have a very high attendance at this point in time.
uh, we unfortunately I have to leave some wonderful questions uh, unanswered. Uh, but uh, but if you feel free to to uh, contact Professor Wong uh, separately on on some of those, uh, I really enjoyed the event. I enjoyed the lecture, Professor Wong. Thank you so much for uh, enlightening us on the fiscal reforms of China the next thirty years, and indeed we can work on it for another thirty years, I believe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming and have a, well, it's not yet weekend. Have a, have a good evening. Bye-bye.